Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another very special video. This is a full lore movie on the many comic book releases for the Gears of War Expanded Universe. The stories explained from the comics in this lore movie are in no particular order as they are based on different characters, factions and eras in the Gears of War universe. But not to worry my friends, because I've got the timestamps provided for you. It's time for another lore movie with your host, the Absmeister. So grab your popcorn, rev your lancer chainsaws, and let's get into this. The Living Legend, Marcus Phoenix, Battle Hardened, Pendulum Wars Hero, Locust War Lionheart. The stories didn't do him justice two months after the Lightmass Bomb was detonated which obviously took place at the end of Gears of War 1, 14 years after Emergence Day. Southeast of Jacinto, Gear soldier Jay Stratton was in trouble against the Locust. He wasn't as battle hardened as Gears such as Marcus and Dom. He was a lot younger and he had been in a few minor skirmishes, but never been in the middle of an all out Locust swarm. They had killed dozens of dozens of Locust drones, but the Locust just kept coming. They were everywhere, Jace had a few times where he thought he was a goner, and he would have been, if it weren't for Marcus Phoenix. While Jace was nearly getting his head blown off, doing his best just to stay alive, Marcus was handling shit like nobody's business. They'd all heard the stories about him, the Pendulum Wars, Asphalt Fields, Timgad, a living legend right there in the flesh. But the stories didn't do him justice, the guy was simply unreal. So from here, Jace and Marcus go to find the rest of Delta, where they later regroup with Dom and Gil Gonzalez, and also find Michael Barrick. Barrick was part of Echo 6 and the last survivor. The rest of the squad was unfortunately KIA. Therefore, Barrick would head back to Jacinto along with Marcus and the rest of Delta. So this part of the story, from the Locust's perspective, is why you just don't mess with Marcus Phoenix. You simply don't stand a chance, and Jace witnessed that firsthand. Eventually, after another fight, they're back in Jacinto. Gonzalez was unfortunately killed in action, and him and other gears were cremated by Marcus and Cole. Dom reunites with Anya, but she hadn't met Marcus yet since he returned to Jacinto. She was always the one to usually find him first. Marcus was in a bar, called the Rusty Nail, on his own, probably collecting his thoughts after losing yet another soldier. A never-ending nightmare. Anya offers her condolences to Marcus regarding Gonzalez, but all of a sudden two dudes come out of nowhere and start hitting on Anya. They want to buy her a drink, but Anya of course declines. Marcus says the lady said no. So Marcus and the dude on the left go back and forth verbally before Anya gets in a cheap shot in the guy's face. Busting up his nose, his friend says crazy bitch and tries to attack her. So Marcus crushes his hand and says, I'll tell you one last time, you're playing the wrong goddamn game while the man screams in agony. Then the other dude is ready to fight Marcus. Anya says, Marcus, this guy's not gonna take a hint because he wasn't backing down yet. To which the man replies, wait, like Marcus Phoenix? Um, oh my God, I'm sorry, so sorry, really. And obviously he backed off because he didn't want any piece of Marcus Phoenix. And that my friends, from a human perspective and a locust perspective, is why you just don't want to mess with or pick a fight with Marcus Phoenix. Locust High General, Military Genius, Visionary for the Horde. Uzon Ram was unlike any other locust, and I've got some stories to explain why. This is why you don't mess with General Ram, from a locust, lambent, and from a human's perspective. Let's start from a locust's perspective. So at one point during the Lambent War, in the expansion Hollow, Vol Khan, so Lieutenant Khan, was alongside two Locust drones, who are just private ranks, who are under his supervision. They disobeyed his orders by just randomly shooting a Lambent Drudge in the distance, just for the sake of it, while both of the drones laughed away. Khan whacks the drone on the head, as his way of disciplining the drone. We see someone say, leading disciplined shit sacks always was your speciality. Step forth, Vold Ram alongside Vol Jamad, Lieutenant and Sergeant respectively. Ram asks for an update on Khan and his soldier's defence of the expansion hollow against the Lambent. Ram wonders how quiet the expansion hollow is compared to other parts in the hollow that have a much larger Lambent presence. 
Khan says he suspects the Lambent are boring tunnels around the cavern to encircle his blight. He said he fears this position will fall soon. Ram angrily responds, Fear? Aren't you exhausted from being so afraid all the time, Vold Khan? Khan shudders and says, I am Vold Ram. Ram states that he's exhausted too from towing the line, risking his men to keep an infinite enemy from their sacred inner hollow. As he is saying this, the two drones are still laughing at what they did earlier. Ram sees this and approaches the drone that took the shot on the Lambent Judge Prior. Ram says, Enlighten me, maggot. Did you disobey a previous order from your Vold? The drone says, Vold Ram? Ram says, Yes, you did. Ram shoves his serrated knife through the head of the drone, killing him instantly. No second chances, no messing around. Do as you're told. Step out of line and you will feel the wrath of Ram. This is one little story from a locust's perspective as to why you don't mess with Ram. Now let's look at a Lambent's perspective. Waves and waves of Lambent had attacked the Temple of the Trinity. Scourge, Khan and his soldiers defended the temple alongside a couple of Cantus priests. Khan is about to be killed by a Lambent wretch, but suddenly the Lambent wretch is sniped in the head. That was Vol Jamad, an expert marksman Ram praises Jamad and then orders a squadron of boomers to sear flesh, rend bone. The boomers fire their boom shots into the hordes of Lambent as Khan, Scourge and Keats of Roll get to safety. Ram says, anyone else tired of killing these fuckers through a scope? Then, on his own, he jumped down the huge cliff they were stood on and he landed right in front of dozens and dozens of Lambent. Ram charged at the Lambent, ripping tearing through them with the serrated knife with ease. The Lambent stood no chance as they were sliced and diced by the monstrous locust. Ram was an absolute machine and the Lambent witnessed that firsthand. Now let's look at it from a cog's or human's perspective. So on emergence day, Ram asked Scourge what the Trinity says of their plans to invade the surface. Scourge says a thunderous rise and a savage fall. He warned Ram that Ram cannot outrun his fate that his death will come eventually. Ram commanded Scourge to keep his fate at a distance. Until then, it was time to shred groundwalker flesh. They had attacked the city of Janamon. Ram watches a cedar take out a raven helicopter, then Ram gets to work. Shredding human flesh with his Troika heavy machine gun, as well as his trusty serrated knife. Lighting up gear soldiers and piercing through the heads of close by gears using his serrated knife. Another gear tried to catch Ram off guard by shooting at him, but Ram turned around and launched his serrated knife through the gear soldier's skull, a perfect headshot, killing him instantly. And that, finally, is a cog's perspective as to why you don't stand a chance against Ram, one of the most iconic locusts from the Gears universe. The rise of Ram didn't come without dethroning his predecessor, who was known as Uzil Srak. A monstrous and menacing figure that was more brawn than brains, and was part of the first ever generation of locust drones. Srak was one of the first ever locust, and he, just like his brothers, were cared for by Mira in the Mount Kadar laboratory. Srak and the others were receptive to Mira's commands through the hive mind, and she ordered them to slaughter the scientists in the facility, and the drones were later led into the hollow by their new queen. Srak eventually became a devoted follower and protector of Mira and their people, probably due to his sheer size and strength, as he was a mighty 12 feet tall, so unlike your standard drone. And eventually he was promoted to Uzil, also known as High General of the Locust Army. But many, many years later, 17 years before Emergence Day, in the Hollow, many Locust drones and Hollow creatures were overexposed to emulsion vapours, and therefore began to turn lambent mutating into monstrous, hostile creatures, aiming to kill and infect any other unaffected life forms. This epidemic in the hollow became worse and worse, and this led to the Lambent War beginning seven years before Emergence Day, with the Locust protecting their homes and capital city against the formidable Lambent force. During this war there were two visionaries of the Horde, Scourge and Vold Ram, who was the lieutenant of his own Blight of Locust, named the Bloodied Vanguard. After the Bloodied Vanguard defeated the Horde of Lambent in the Outer Hollow, Ram showed Scourge his vision. 
Ram told Vel Jamad to assess the strength of the Blight, stating that they will march for the Inner Hollow on his return. Ram showed Scorch's plans to invade the surface, stating that the Lambent War is an endless war of attrition and lost ground. On the surface, the humans' focus was on their enemy ahead, as the coalition of ordered governments battled the Union of Independent Republics in the Pendulum Wars. Ram said the humans have no imagination for the enemy that marches below, and the mindless Lambent abominations can have the hollow, while the Horde can conquer the surface. Ram and Scourge abandoned the outer hollow and marched their blight to the doors of the royal palace to speak to Uzil Srak. Ram said to Srak that the war was lost, while Srak stayed in the safety of the inner hollow, demanding that he will speak to Queen Mira to show the war is over, and that Srak's utter incompetence will put an end to the Locust Horde. Srak saw this as a coup and attacked Ram, blocking his punch, then headbutting Ram, slamming him onto a table and punching his face ordering him to return back to the Gorgon front of the Hollow with the bloodied vanguard. Srak spoke to Mira and reassured her that the Hollows were safe, but he warned Mira that Ram is warforged and his blight of loyal drones will follow him no matter what. Ram knew that the Queen would have overheard the conversation and he had made an impression, one way or another. Mira knew that the Lambent had won the war for the Hollows and Srak was only telling her what she wanted to hear. Srak then sent a corpser to kill Ram and his vanguard, but the vanguard were able to defeat the corpser. Scourge noted that Srak is a living muscle, known for his strength, not his mind. Therefore, the corpser was sent by the help of Ukon, the locust geneticist. Ram sent Scourge back to the inner hollow, to the temple to convince Kitovrol that the inner hollow will fall, whilst Ram went to talk to another lieutenant in the expansion hollow, Vold Khan. Back at the locust council, the members of the council went back and forth as Srak threatened Ukon to leave matters of war to the true spawn of the sires, further reiterating that he was one of the first locust. Meanwhile, Mira reiterated that Ram is the most promising Vold in the army and he has every opportunity to prove himself loyal. Ram convinced Khan of his vision to lose his war in the expansion hollow so that the Lambent could reach the Temple of the Trinity in the inner hollow as well as explaining his plans to claim Sarah for Queen and Horde. Khan helped make this a reality, as the retreating Khan and his drones arrived at the temple, chased behind a horde of Lambent, as Ram and his Blight cleaned up the mess directly in front of Keet of Roll. Now Keet of Roll was enraged, wondering why the supposed Master of War Srak had not heeded the warning of the Lambent. Vrol urged Scourge and Ram to present the truth to Mira, stating that he will stand as their witness. As Ram approached the council chambers, two Theron sentinels said to Ram that they heard what he did at the temple, that there were no longer any among the Theron that doubted him, and the Horde hungers for strong decisive leadership like him. They said when the time comes, do not forget your allies. Ram, alongside Scourge, reported to the Locust Council on the fall of the expansion hollow, and the attack on the temple which the bloodied vanguard had driven off. Srak was enraged, calling Ram's actions a staged coup and that the Queen must not believe them. Mira was angered by his audacity and warned Srak not to tell her what to think or she'd feed him to the Krill while he was still alive. Srak apologised and tried to convince Keita Vrol that Ram was using the Trinity of Worms to manipulate him, leading to an angry outburst from Keita Vrol over everyone on the council, abandoning the old ways. Srak began to assault Ram stating that he had not delivered a report of a hopeless war, he refused to lie down and die. But this assault was interrupted by the arrival of Old Khan, with information for the Queen. Mira silenced everyone to hear Khan's report, and he explained that Ram had been developing a plan far from the eyes of Srak, and he agreed that the war was lost. Queen Mira demanded to know how the Lambent were able to reach the temple in the first place, and why she had three Volds reporting to her a situation that she was supposedly unaware of. Srak admitted that he had no worthy response for that. When Ram began to speak of victory, Srak angrily demanded that Ram bended Craven Knee to a threat, breaking down their defences and spoke of victory. Ram suggested unleashing the Horde on the surface against the humans, and the council began to debate the matter as if Srak wasn't there. Srak demanded to know of his opinion on the matter, but Mira stated that it no longer mattered. 
She would now be advised by Uzil Ram. Mira stated that the hollow was their home and they would never cede it to the Lamban. Therefore, she intended to send her strongest warrior, Srak, to the front line against the Lamban. Mira ordered Srak to rally his blight and hold the line, while those with ambition secured their future on the surface. And then she dismissed everyone but Ram. In private discussion with Ram, Mira revealed that she knew of his plan and allowed it. Srak's banishment to the front line was a formality. He was undone by his own failures, and Ram simply laid them bare for the council. On emergence day, as Ram led the locust horde to shred human flesh, Ram and Scourge were taking human lives. But suddenly, Srak, enraged with the loss of his position, ambushed Ram and Scourge. Srak attacked Ram, but when Scourge berated Srak, who was now a vold for his actions, Srak attacked Scourge and stated that a title was not earned, but taken. Srak challenged Ram to face him as a drone in a fight. But Ram said that he was a coward, hiding behind a metal fortress of mad technology with his armour. Strength was in the flesh. Srak vowed to reclaim his rightful place, while Ram stated that he would claim Srak's head as his victory prize. The two engaged in a duel that ended with Ram burying his blade in Srak's shoulder and Srak grabbing Ram by the throat. Now remember the two Theron guards from before that had claimed to be on Ram's side? Well, as Srak gloated about his victory, Ram kicked clear and signalled the two nearby Theron guards. The two Therons shot the former Uzil with their talk bows, destroying the chest piece of his formidable armour and seriously wounding Srak. Ram had outsmarted Srak again, he mocked Srak's armour and then he tore out his heart with his bare hands, killing him and putting an end to Srak. In the words of Ram, a true warrior needs only his bare hands. Ram revealed to the Theron guards that he had anticipated Srak's attack and set a trap for him which Srak had fallen into, right as Ram had predicted. Ultimately, Srak was one of the first ever Locust and rose to power within the Horde, mainly due to his sheer size and strength. He was a formidable force, but he wasn't a master of war. He was the architect of his own demise and got outsmarted by Ram. This story emphasised how much of a military genius and strategist Ram was. Ram was warforged, while Srak was not. The story also shows that although a force of nature in his own right, Ram was very intelligent and this was further illustrated in how he located and ambushed Cog officers in the Locust War as well. This was the fall of Srak and the rise of Ram in Gears of War lore. A boulder of a man, meditative, spiritual, warrior philosopher, Tykelisa was as tough as a brumak. One of my favourite underrated characters in Gears of War lore. Here is the very, very sad story behind Tai Kaliso. His story begins four years before Emergence Day during the Pendulum Wars on his homeland, Eroma Island. In 4 BE, Eroma was attacked by the Union of Independent Republics. While the main tribal forces defended the village, Tai began stalking UIR squads and taking them out one by one as they moved through the jungle. He stalked a UIR patrol that was heading towards his village, slit in the rear Indy's throat and then jumped onto the next one and stabbed him in the neck. He then grabbed the Indy's weapon and shot the other two members of the patrol as they tried to attack him. Tai then headed back to his village but was horrified to discover that it had been destroyed by the UIR in his absence, with everyone in it being brutally slaughtered. In the words of Tai, some have said that war is hell. War is not hell, for in hell, innocence is spared. When a man has nothing left, when everything has been taken from him, he becomes his enemy's worst nightmare. Tai continued his tactics of hunting down indie squads in revenge, determined to become the indie's worst nightmare. During a rainstorm, Tai stalked a lone man and prepared to shoot him with an arrow, but the man was none other than Marcus Phoenix himself. Marcus said, wouldn't do that if I were you. Look, I'm not going to give you a bunch of bullshit. The UIR came through and massacred your people. I know, I'm with a coalition of ordered governments and we're here to get rid of them. We could use your help, but again, I'm not going to bullshit you. We're not saints, but we are going to win this fucking war and I'd rather have you on the winning side. 
Marcus saw the warrior that Tai was and knew he would have been of great use to the cog. In Tai's words, when a man has nothing left, he is ready for change. And so Tai joins the coalition of ordered governments. Three years later, in the Battle of Asphalt Fields, during the Pendulum Wars, Tai was taking indie names like nobody's business, avenging his family, friends and the rest of his people. We see him destroy two soldiers with relative ease. As he went over to make sure they were dead, he heard one of the soldiers talking about wanting to see his family again and how he loved them. Tai gave comfort to the passing soldier until his soul passed on, telling him to be at peace and that his family knew. In Tai's words, my people believed that the body was sacred, but only when a soul dwelled within. Once a soul had passed, the body was but a husk. So then he uses the body as a meat shield and killed two more indie soldiers that had been trying to sneak up on him. He ends this fight by saying, your enemy forgives you. Then we fast forward 15 years later, six months after the light mass bombing at Timgad, which took place at the end of Gears of War 1. The cog drove to land down in order to drill down into the hollow. Tai rode on rig D14 on the road to the city. His assault derrick was in the rear guard and Tai's rig joined up with Deltas near the city, having managed to avoid being attacked en route to the city. However, it was destroyed by Tickers the moment it entered the city, killing Tai's entire squad. But Tai, being the bolder of a man that he is, somehow survived, and he joined up with Delta One once again. Dom said, Marcus, is that Tai? To which Marcus responded, yeah, told you it was tough to kill. Tai said, fate has thrown us together again, her Marcus. Marcus told him it was good to have him back, and that he was sorry about his squad, but Tai responded that everything happened for a reason. Hours later, in the land down assault, Locust High Priest and New General, Scourge, attacks and cuts a rig in half with his chainsaw staff. A gear soldier, Dizzy, told Marcus and Dom, I'll hold him off boys, get your asses down there, as in down there into the hollow. But Tai comes out of nowhere, he jumped out of his grind lift to help Dizzy and to protect everyone else and so Tai began to fight Scourge. In the words of Tai, every warrior has an equal, an opposing force, equal in strength. Because Tai was a monster of a man, he was holding his own against a damn locust general, whose size, speed and durability was far superior. He was taking it to Scourge, but slowly, Scourge began to get the upper hand. Tai said, every warrior has a superior, an opposing force that he cannot overcome. Tai screams to Dizzy, go, now, go because he knew he was done for, and Dizzy would be next. Dizzy hesitated for a second, but Tai shouted again, Go! Dizzy was a force in his own right, as most Gears would be, but if a warrior like Tai stood little to no chance, then Dizzy would have been outright mauled. So Dizzy escaped. Tai was unfortunately defeated, and taken captive. He and others were led into the hollow, and brutally processed, and then imprisoned on a torture barge. This is where we begin to see the downfall of Tai. In the words of Tai, My grandfather once told me that a soul will leave its body when it is time, not always at death. When the body becomes a prison, it is time for the soul to escape. And once the soul is gone, the body will follow soon after. There is the light. There is the void. There is the darkness. Rest in peace, Tai Kaliso. So, that my friends, is the very sad story behind Tai Kaliso. Now you may understand why he's one of my many favourite characters from the Gears of War universe, as he didn't have a long standing appearance in the franchise, but his character development and storytelling made me love him very much. Sergeant Jonathan Harper, veteran soldier, prisoner of war, dying hero. His story, seen in the Gears of War comics, is interesting and also very sad. Harper alongside Echo 9 were assigned to Timgad City. Meanwhile, the COG prepared for the light mass offensive, in which a light mass bomb would be launched into the outer hollow, using tunnel mapping data from the sonic resonator and strike at the heart of the Locust stronghold. The light mass bomb was placed on the Tyro pillar as the train would fall into an emotion sinkhole from a collapsed bridge and deliver the bombs straight into the outer hollow. Harper and other members of Echo 9 witnessed the Tyro pillar depart Despite the train being hijacked by General Ram, the COG was successful in boarding the train, killing General Ram, installing the tunnel data, and launching the light mass bomb into the outer hollow. The bomb collapsed Timgad Valley as Harper and the rest of Echo 9 cheered on. 
The bombing itself was an almost religious experience for Harper, likening it to an act of God. For a while, it had seemed like the cog had stopped the locust for good. For a while. Harper and his squad were stationed in Timgad for two months after the bombing, and he believed for a while that the locust might have been permanently stopped. However, the locust re-emerged stronger than ever, and Harper and his men fought off a resurging locust presence in the area as well as the city of Tolan being sunk by unknown means. During this time, Harper and the other gears stationed in Timgad, as well as the civilians living there, were exposed to heavy amounts of emulsion vapour due to the light mass bombing. After Timgad, Harper and his squad were stationed in Jacinto, patrolling the city perimeter. After being stationed there for three months, he and the other gears who were stationed in Timgad came down with a sickness. One of Harper's squad mates, Michael Barrick revealed it was called rust lung as he was infected with it as well. Harper and the other infected suffered from vertigo, persistent cough and insomnia. Tests were run on them at Jacinto Med and Dr. Merriweather told Harper he was suffering these symptoms due to him being unable to accept the harsh reality of war. This angered Harper and he knew this was false, that it was just an excuse and a cover up and wished that the doctors would just tell him what's going on. Harper and the other Gears were not given time to recover from their illness. One month after visiting Jacinto Med, Harper was deployed along with the rest of the COG army for Operation Hollow Storm. He felt that the mission was a last ditch attempt to win the war and likely suicidal. He was happy that the weather was good before the assault derricks began drilling, feeling that the surface was giving them a proper goodbye. Once he and his squad drilled down into the hollow in ground lifts, they linked up with several other squads and did not encounter enemy forces for a while. He had become dizzy from the ride down, but was relieved that his rust lung symptoms were not acting up. Harper wrote in his journal about the experience and wished that the fighting would start, because he was tired of waiting. He left his journal behind with his grind lift, but once they did encounter the locust, Harper and the other gears were quickly overwhelmed. Many of the gears were killed. Harper said, the lucky ones died as the rest of them were taken as prisoners of war. In the words of Harper, they tortured us, demeaned us, tried to break our spirit, but they didn't break mine. Harper would have witnessed so many soldiers break, one by one. He found a piece of paper to write on, and he wrote a warning to others about the Locust's new tactics, and encouraged them to try and escape. When the Locust tried to put him in one of their storage coffins, also known as the torture pods, Harper resisted and surprised his guard with a quick punch to his face, squeezing his neck until the drone died. He then ran for his life through the hollow until he encountered Alpha 7 under the command of Corporal J. Stratton. He took armour and a lancer from one of the squad's dead gears and fought alongside them, determined to reach the surface and see the sun again. They fought their way to the surface, escaping the locust and a corpse and returned to Jacinto City. Harper saw the sky again. He had survived the hollow. He had survived, in essence, a suicide mission. As the locust attacked the city, Harper assisted in protecting and evacuating civilians. He covered an evacuation raven, holding off the locust so that a little girl and her family could get on board. He killed all of the locust, but was fatally wounded by them. He took those bullets, but he saved that family. No medics around, but that was okay. The sky was so bright, and he felt alright. As he lay dying, he kept hearing the little angel telling him thank you in her sweet little voice. The girl said she'd pray for him. She said she'd pray for them all. And that was the end. Rest in peace, Jonathan Harper. A very sad, but quite a bittersweet story, as he was going to die from Ruslong anyway, but the fact that he was able to escape the hollow and see the sky again and save that family gave him peace of mind before his inevitable death. Sergeant Will Carmine, Pendulum Wars veteran, member of the iconic, pretty large Carmine family. The Carmines were known to not be the best survivors of war. This running theme, unfortunately, applied to Will Carmine as well. Six weeks after the UIR signed the armistice, ending the Pendulum Wars, Will was positioned in a COG forward operating base just outside the city of Janamont. The story begins with Will Carmine looking at an old photo. Carmine wearing his COG combat helmet and the rest of his squad posed for a photo in front of a large COG flag. He and his squad had more than one victory under their belts against the Union of Independent Republics. 
We can assume he was the only survivor from that squad, but it is unclear. The pendulum wars were over. He called his Mark I Lancer rifle Nina and handed it to Lieutenant Dane Forge alongside his armour and the rest of his gear. He was just glad he was leaving the hellhole with all his limbs still intact. This was a little dig at Forge because as you can see, Forge was missing a left arm which you can assume he lost in the war. Will fought under the command of his father, who reported to his grandfather. He began to believe he'd have to send his kids to war as well, which was probably why he never had none. Ford said he could now have as many as he wanted, but Carmine said fuck that, I want to live in peace. Forge asked him to stay and train the new recruits, but Will insisted, no more guns. His body had already retired two years prior. As the two were talking, suddenly, the ground falls out from under one of the recruits, and a giant hole appeared in the middle of the armory out of absolute nowhere. Carmine, Forge and two recruits were in utter disbelief. Will said, Dane, just what in the fuck is that? While both of them and the two recruits peer into the hole, after seeing multiple glowing lights, a corpse of claw burst out from the hole, impaling one of the recruits to a nearby wall. The corpser then emerged from the hole, killing the other recruit with its other claw and knocking Will and Dane back. Carmine yelled to Forge to throw him a gun, so he grabs Nina and throws it to Carmine. Will Carmine starts to fire at the corpser while making his way back behind some rubble to take cover. He then asks what the hell the things that are attacking them are as locust drones start to appear from the hole. Dane Forge tries to respond but gets impaled through the wall he was taking cover behind by the corpse's claw. Will Carmine was shocked by his friend's death so he blind fires his entire clip at the approaching drones. While he was reloading his lancer, you see a monstrous shadow above him. This was General Ram. Ram grabs Will and proceeds to choke him. Will Carmine, trying to breathe, asks the large grub what the hell he is, though Ram stays silent. Ram then rams his knife through the bottom of Will's chin, killing Will Carmine instantly. Rest in peace, Will Carmine. From Will finally being at peace from the Pendulum Wars ending, according to the Siren's famous saying, he was one of the lucky ones that died on Emergence Day as he wasn't alive to witness what Sarah had become shortly after. Some time after the events of Gears of War 1 in the Light Mass Offensive, the COG-controlled city of Jelaine was overrun by Locust forces. Marcus Phoenix and co were sent to rescue the survivors, but they encountered many problems along the way. This is Marcus Phoenix versus the Unarmored Mauler. The city of Jelaine was the birthplace of Alex Brand, and Alex, just like many young girls, were drafted into Chairman Prescott's repopulation program, which was essentially major breeding farms, where young women were artificially inseminated. If that didn't work, then the quote-unquote old-fashioned way was used, where the best of gears were recruited to impregnate the young girls. When a young girl failed to become impregnated, then she was deemed to be barren and was sent onto the front lines. Alex Brand being one of them, and that should give an overview of the place and situation Marcus Phoenix and the rest of Delta find themselves in, as the Locust forces had overran Jelaine's garrison, and the survivors, in the form of women and children, were left to fend for themselves. So let's get straight into the action. As Delta Squad rescued many women and children in the last location of the humans in Jelaine, and got them to safety in a bunker, a kid was still left out there in the open. The Locust had seen this kid, for the Scarred Cantus, who was the leader of the Locust forces in this battle, told his forces to hold fire as he awaited to ambush the Gears. The unarmored Mauler held its position as Marcus Phoenix noticed the separated child and tried to make his way to the kid. But just as he was about to reach the child, the Scarred Cantus yelled to the Locust forces to start the attack. The unarmored Mauler immediately charged right through a nearby wall and smashed it to bits, bursting out the other side and punching Marcus Phoenix in the face, catching him off guard and knocking him out cold. Marcus was out and the battle had started. The Scarred Cantus ordered his locust drones and the unarmored Mauler to commence the battle and so they did. The unarmored Mauler wasn't like the average Mauler Boomer variant. It was very unique, being physically larger, stronger, and more muscular than an average mauler. 
His strength was on par with that of a berserker, being able to smash through a concrete wall with just his fists, with ease and without any pain. He was a force to be reckoned with and he also seemed to be a lot more intelligent than your average mauler, but the unarmoured mauler still equipped the signature mauler helmet and an explosive flail, but he did not wear any upper body armour and didn't require the use of a boom shield. As Dom and Cole took the fight to the Locust, the female survivors pressed the button to close the doors, shutting them off to the Locust, the Kid and Marcus as well, stating that he's not their highest priority. Dom and Cole are really worried about Marcus, especially Dom of course, stating that they got to get to him, his heartbeat still pinging, but Bed ordered them to stand down and told the two of them to keep him covered while he came up with a plan. Cole said to Alex that Dom was a commando way before him and Bed signed up on E-Day, but Dom's a player like Cole, not a coach. Marcus always figured that if he went down, it would be up to Bed to figure out a way to save the day. Meanwhile, Baird requested heavy evac from control. Cole sees that Marcus is now conscious and Baird comes to the realisation that the Locust haven't killed Marcus because they want to ambush the rescue team. Therefore, he knows that there's a smarter one amongst them, a third one commander or a Cantus priest, and he tries to put himself in their shoes to try and think what the Locust leader will be thinking. Baird concludes that the Cantus or Theron will have the numerical advantage perhaps even surrounding the skies, and at least one heavy or more. He concludes that they need to make the Locusts think that they're going to win, that it's inevitable, otherwise they'll call for heavier guns, and then it would be over for all of them. So Baird orders for only Dom, Cole and Jace to shoot, but fire like they're short on ammo, and then they let the Locust forces in, as frag grenades will be planted and set on proximity. Cole keeps shooting, but Dom tells him not too much, and to go easier on them, while Baird sets things up and orders the rest to fit through the holes and get to the other side to safety. After a long pause, with no one emerging from the bunker, the unarmoured mauler grabbed his explosive flail and began to advance on the door to the bunker. Using all his strength, he swung the flail hitting the door very hard, but not enough to knock it over. The unarmoured mauler then waited a few moments, and then took another mighty swing at the door all while listening to children cry over the facility speakers that Baird had set up. The unarmoured mauler took another pause, giving the scarred Cantus time to revive some of the injured drones with its chanting, and once they were healed, the mauler charged at the door again, but this time he used his body instead, finally advancing into the bunker and knocking over the door, which was all part of Baird's plan. Dom and Cole finally ran, and the mauler and the drones charged through the door, unaware that the whole entryway was trapped with bolo grenades. Baird flicked the detonator switch and set off all of the grenades simultaneously, blowing the unarmoured mauler and the drones to smithereens. The scarred Cantus began to panic after seeing most of his drones killed, so he tried to heal one of the injured drones, but while doing so, he left himself exposed and was shot down and killed by Baird and Co who out ambushed the intelligent Scarred Cantus. The Scarred Cantus may have been very smart, but he was outsmarted by the blonde genius Baird. They were finally able to rescue Marcus. His brothers in arms refused to let him go down. Marcus Phoenix took a major L and was outsmarted by the Scarred Cantus and beaten by the unarmored Mauler. But the rest of Delta always proved once again as to why they were the best in the business. Brothers to the end. As tough as nails, a heavy smoker, a mountain of a man, but an intelligent man. Michael Barrick was one of the many underrated characters from the Gears of War expanded universe, but unfortunately, he could not outrun his fate. Michael Barrick was one of the many soldiers stationed in the Timgad region at the time of the light mass bombing at the end of Gears of War 1. After the bombing, all of the Gears stationed in Timgad began developing the terminal respiratory condition known as Ruslung including Barrick himself. Two months later, Michael Barrick lost his entire squad in a skirmish southwest of Jacinto and was found by Delta-1. A week later, Barrick was reassigned to Delta-1 once again. They were sent on a mission to the city of Montevado to investigate reports of the city experiencing seismic disturbances. 
Once they reached Montevado, Barrick asked them what the seismic disturbance they were looking for was going to look like. Marcus realised he had a point, and Don pointed out that they did not have any specialised equipment to detect anything. So Marcus later became annoyed with the mission, and ordered the squad to split up. With Barrick and Marcus scouting the south side of the city, while Dom and Jace took the north side, and see if they could find anything. As they searched, Marcus asked about Barrick's family, assuming that that is why he joined Operation Lifeboat. This was basically a COG propaganda policy that involved the conscription of Stranded into the COG army, in return for transporting their families to more secure regions in Jacinto. But Barrick told Marcus that he joined up because being a gear was far more interesting than being a Stranded. Barrick was confused that no one was left at all in a city the size of Montevado, but Marcus told him they might just be hiding extremely well. Barrick coughed again and spat out blood, so Marcus told him he needs to quit smoking, but Barrick said it was not the smoking that was causing the blood, it was Ruslung. But before he could explain more about Ruslung, they came under attack by a group of wretches. They killed several of them, but the rest suddenly retreated when the ground began to shake. Montevado then began to sink into the ground, for reasons unknown to the Gears. They survived the sinking, but most of Barrick's armour was badly damaged and falling off. Barrick and Marcus discovered their bot, called Stan, was crushed under falling rocks. The two then headed to regroup with Jason and Dom, using their armour locators to guide them. As they moved towards them, Barrick informed Marcus about Ruslung, and how a bunch of Gears who had been stationed in Timgad after the bombing, came down with Ruslung, including him. He told Marcus that it had been getting worse since then, so that was why he was unconcerned with smoking, and he lit up the last cigarette in his pack, which would be very symbolic to show that his end was near. When the two reached Dom and Jace, they found them under attack in a heart leech nest. Marcus and Barrick helped save Dom and Jace, and eliminated all of the heart leeches. After they killed the leeches, Marcus told them they were going to stay together and wait for evacuation the next day. But unfortunately, this is where you just don't know what's going to happen next. A corpse suddenly punched through a nearby wreckage, and blood mounts came pouring through, supported by drones. The four of them were ambushed and were under attack. As they fought the blood mounts, they discovered that they were very low on ammo, and you need a lot of ammo to kill blood mounts. They managed to kill several, but they were going to be overrun, they simply didn't have the ammo. Jace hoped that Marcus could think of a plan. He always did. So Marcus ordered Dom and Jace to climb out of the sinkhole, while he and Barrick held the locust back. Barrick eventually told Marcus to escape himself as well, that Marcus had a squad to save, but Marcus told him that there were too many to take on by himself. Barrick said that he knew that, he had already smoked the last cigarette in the pack, and that the Ruslung was going to kill him eventually. He wanted to die fighting. Barrick's mind was set. He had made his decision. He ripped off the remains of his armour and charged into the locust lines barehanded. He fought off the locust and blood mounts with his fists. Barrick said, Go man, go! You got a squad to get out of this hellhole. Marcus hesitated, but Barrick said again, Go! As he ripped locust apart, Marcus escaped. And Barrick was shot by a beast rider in the back as he killed two other locusts with his fists. However, he managed to hold off the locust long enough for the rest of Delta 1 to escape, dying a hero's death to save their lives. Rest in peace, Michael Barrick. He had smoked the last cigarette in the pack, but he went out with a bang, saving his fellow Gears from death. A badass, taking on locust with just his fists. Barrick was one of the many underrated characters from the Gears Expanded Universe. Make a mean gear, kid. Here's to the good fight, living to see another day. Jace Stratton's past. Jace was just a child on Emergence Day. He witnessed his parents and his brother getting shot by the locust while he hid in a closet, clinging on to his teddy. He then held his dying brother in his arms until he passed, 
crying the whole time. Shortly after, when the surrounding locusts were killed by Gears, he became buried under a pile of debris, but he was saved by several people, including Dr. Gregory Wisen, a child psychologist and educator who managed to pull the debris off him and took him to safety. He would later be considered as Jason's adoptive father because they developed a close relationship as Jace was brought to the orphanage which was known as the Children's School of Hope. This was where Jace made his new home as a young child along with other orphans in Alima City. 14 years after Emergence Day, the COG made a final, desperate decision to wipe out the advancing locust. Evacuating humanity's last biggest stronghold, Jacinto City, the COG deployed the Hammer of Dawn to sink Jacinto and drown the locust forces and their homeland. But what happened after this, before the start of Gears of War 3? After the sinking of Jacinto, the column of refugees moved from place to place, evading the few surviving locusts, eventually settling on a remote volcanic island that the locust never reached. Vectus, a former COG naval base, the local population had never seen a grub, but it is plagued by stranded pirate gangs, forming an unexpected alliance with the last of the UIR's Graznians. The COG newcomers and the islanders drive off the stranded pirate gangs and begin to rebuild civilization. A year later, in 15 AE, the brief peace is shattered when lambent lifeforms appear in the seas around Vectus, destroying ships and sinking a Graznian emulsion drilling platform, the last remaining source of emulsion fuel. Chairman Prescott is found to have an encrypted data disk, the contents of which he refused to reveal to Colonel Hoffman. The remnant of the COG is now effectively besieged on Vectus, fending off lambent attacks from the sea. Lambent stalks begin to overrun the island. Unknown to Hoffman or anyone else, Prescott has been in touch with a secure COG facility called Azura throughout the Locust and the Lambent War. And Adam Phoenix, not dead, as everyone believed. Adam has been held there since the fall of the COG capital, Ephira, working on a countermeasure. He's found that Lambency is a parasitic organism that will eventually destroy all life on Sera. While Prescott secretly updates Adam on the increasing rate of the Lambent mutation, Hoffman and his gears fight a losing battle to contain the Lambent. Eventually, Prescott decides to take vital biological samples to Adam to continue the research, but Prescott refuses to reveal his reasons for abandoning the population of Vectus. Prescott leaves Hoffman, Michelson and Trescu to run what's left of the COG. He isn't heard from again and is presumed dead. After a few months, the Lambent have all but overrun Vectus and Hoffman is forced to evacuate the island. With no single safe location left on Sera where society can be rebuilt, the survivors are split into small groups to maximize their chances of survival. The COG ceases to exist. Hoffman takes one band of refugees to Anvil Gate. The Graznians return home and the rest find shelter in small settlements on the mainland. Captain Michelson and a core force of gears remain at sea in the helicopter carrier Sovereign, ready to assist civilians scattered ashore. But by 16 AE, they've lost radio contact with Anvil Gate, and it's become clear that they're just another band of refugees trying to survive. Looks like everyone is stranded now. In 17 AE, the Locust, trying to escape the Lambent and survive at any cost, find Azura, the secret research facility, and capture it killing off the scientists and taking Adam Phoenix prisoner. Sharon Prescott escapes and tracks down Sovereign to ask for help in driving off the Locust, bringing Marcus Phoenix a message from his father, Adam Phoenix. But the ship comes under immediate attack from Lambent. And that is the beginning of Gears of War 3, where the cog is no more, the Locust have returned, the Lambent have reached the surface. It is now humanity's last fight for survival. In Gears of War, we are accustomed to seeing the most badass, testosterone fueled male soldiers on the front lines taking names and sparing no one. From the legendary war hero Marcus Phoenix, to the unstoppable force the Coltrane, to the warrior philosopher Ty Kaliso, and the unkillable Clayton Carmine, just to name a few. But there are also a few female Gears serving on the front lines against the Locust Horde. 
that earned a feared reputation and were not to be messed with. Now this comic begins with Marcus and Dom taking the fight to the Locust. Marcus narrates, like everything in the COG army, there's an acronym for street fighting, MOUT, military operation in urban terrain. We just know it means close, personal and higher casualties. In the Pendulum Wars, some guys couldn't take it, blackouts, freakouts, suicides, but you didn't give them shit because it might be you someday. Every window, every alley, every room is a possible threat. Breach and clear, breach and clear. The training doesn't do a damned bit of good now. Never another squad behind you to keep it clear. The good news is we don't have to worry about civilians getting caught in the crossfire, but that's only because all the civilians are dead. To win mount battles, you need numbers. The manuals advise three to one odds to be an entrenched urban force. If we're lucky, the odds might be 3 to 1 today. Against. Dom, through comms, says, Foxtrot, you said you covered this block. And they respond, Yeah, Delta, we checked it, cleared it, even took out their grub hole. What about it? Marcus is like, Damn it, and orders Jace to get that door. Dom tells Foxtrot, Well, how about you get back here and clear it for real this time? Foxtrot state that they're en route currently two blocks away, and Dom tells Marcus, we can't wait that long, and Marcus responds, yeah, but with those snipers, we can't leave either. So they were basically stuck, and had to essentially hold their position, with the snipers overlooking, there was no escape. But all of a sudden, two soldiers arrive at the scene, one of them says, hold on Delta, as Marcus, Dom and Jace keep fighting the never ending locust in close quarters combat. One of the two gears says, Delta, the snipers are locked in. It's some kind of base. Only way up is through the building, and it's swarming with tickers. The response is, then drop a frag on the snipers. But this was not an option, because the base was way too high to throw a frag grenade up there, and they didn't even have any frag grenades. All of a sudden, the gear says, Alex, as the other gear climbs up a huge piece of destroyed rock, opposite the base. The other gear yells, Alex, get the hell back here. From this huge rock, the gear dives onto the top of the base, shooting the tickers, and the explosion also takes out the local snipers who were camping up top. Marcus, Dom and Jace are relieved and thankful. Marcus knows that this is it. Now's our chance, move, and Delta take out the remaining locust forces in the area without having to be extremely cautious of the local snipers, who are now dead. Dom says, I thought you were out of grenades. And the response was, that was a ticker. Dom is in awe and says, damn, that dude is hardcore. And the male gear responds, dude, you mean Alex? Maybe I should introduce you. The brave gear who just saved Delta takes off her helmet and we are introduced to Alex Brand. Alex says, so, who wants to give a girl a ride home? Back at Jacinto headquarters, Dom says to Jace, and all that time, I was thinking Alex was a dude. Ah, wow. With Jace responding, I heard this one guy in a squad started calling her Foxy. He woke up in his bunk with a dead heart leech bleeding on his chest. While Dom and Jace both agree that Alex isn't too bad on the eyes either. Meanwhile, Marcus doesn't really care and stays laser focused on what the next mission could be. Liren Prison. Liren Prison was one of the many COG Prisoner of War camps that was operated during the Pendulum Wars. It held prisoners from the Grazni army who suffered abuse at the hands of the gears guarding the facility. Some prisoners were burnt with hot plates while others had their hands cut off. Half of a captured Grazni regiment starved to death within the fort's walls. The Grazni soldiers who survived their time in the facility carried scars with them for the rest of their lives with some of them holding a grudge against the COG for their horrific treatment. The COG government of course never told its civilians or the rest of the armed forces about the war crimes committed against the Grazni. With details about Lairan prison only coming to light during the stranded insurgency on Vectus, when the remnants of the Republic of Grazni joined the COG on the island. One survivor of the prison showed photos of the crimes there to Sergeant Marcus Phoenix, who was horrified at what the gears there had done. Cremation since the emergence day attack, 
Space for burying the dead became limited, especially in stranded controlled areas and of course Jacinto. Therefore, cremation became a norm, especially since the locusts were underground and humans refused to bury their dead in the same soil that their enemies lived in. Imagine, for thousands of years, humans were buried in the ground, just for the humans to later realise that locusts had access to things underground. So it was decided that fellow humans were no longer going to be buried in the ground. This is also why the cog tended to build more memorials to honour the dead. They Also Serve is a comic book story based on the Pendulum Wars. It begins in the 62nd year of the war and follows Adam Phoenix, who is a captain at this particular time, as part of Howard Company of the 26th Royal Tyran Infantry. Captain Phoenix is burying his dead comrade, Private Hansen, and Adam feels he has let him down by not saving him during the battle, and he's wondering what his family will now do. What will Adam tell Hansen's wife, his children? Did Hansen die for freedom, emulsion, or nothing at all? It was nothing but questions as always, but Adam Phoenix thought that it was about time he provided some answers. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Helena Stroud interrupts and asks if Adam has told his wife about his new job offer, the Deputy Director of the Cog Weapons Research, which he says he hasn't told her. Adam wanted to spend more time with Hansen, but was interrupted with orders to intercept Indy armour moving up to Ragani, which is the same way they came from and where Adam lost half of his company. Adam Phoenix wondered if Marcus was also going to be doing this when he became Adam's age. Helena Stroud, the mother of Anya, hoped that her daughter wouldn't be either. Adam Phoenix was annoyed with this mission and said that they didn't have enough forces to hold the road. Colonel Choi told him that he was sorry, but they both had their orders on what to do. So Adam reluctantly mobilised the unit and they headed to Rugani. As the gears looked towards the upcoming convoy, Adam Phoenix wondered that what the COG really need is orbital weapons platforms, reliable surveillance and satellite targeting that can take out a single tank or a whole city. They took out the Indy APCs with RPGs, but the gears were confused as to why they were sent to intercept such a small force when the Fusiliers could just blast through them. So Adam contacted Choi, who informed them that those were just scouts, and that at least 20 more vehicles were inbound, including tanks. Therefore, Adam consulted his gears on what ordnance they had available, and began discussing tactics with Helena Stroud. She began making Molotov cocktails. While waiting for the attack, Adam contemplated leaving the army and joining the Defence Research Agency, believing that he could design a weapon to end the war permanently. However, he wrestled with the idea of abandoning his gears and he didn't want to let them down. Helena arrived and told him to take the job so he could see his son grow up. He told her that she could go home and watch her daughter grow up. She told him to follow his conscience, stop worrying about what others think. Adam asked Helena who looked after Anya while she was deployed, but she said that's personal but the father is not around, and never will be. All of a sudden, the Indies were in town, and had been spotted. The Gears heard a Paria tank among the vehicles. Adam decided to deal with the tank himself, and ordered Corporal Collins to follow him, taking some of the Molotov cocktails with them. Helena directed the rest of the unit against the other vehicles, and the Gears began taking casualties from the tank fire. Private Kinia went to work, treating the wounded, and Helena disabled the Paria with an RPG. Captain Phoenix saw the flawed design of the UIR's Parias, and so he and Collins both tossed their Molotovs into the tank's vents, killing the occupants inside and setting it ablaze. As they ran back to their lines, Adam was shot in the leg and wounded. Kinia came to treat him, and he learnt that 10 Gears had been killed. The Fusiliers arrived and defeated the rest of the Indy vehicles. Adam decided that the war was a waste and he needed to do something to end it. Someone had to break the cycle. Someone had to create weapons 
so powerful that if politicians wanted to wage war, they'd face the same death as the men and women they sent to fight it. Adam Phoenix knew that he could build a deterrent that would bring governments to their senses. An orbital weapon system. And that was his duty now. Unsaid is a Pendulum Wars comic story set in the 75th year of the war. Young Marcus is sat in the core of a helicopter. He looks at a piece of paper and is asked if his dad remembered to write him a letter. But before he could really respond, he is interrupted by Helena Stroud. Marcus said that he received the letter just before he deployed. Helena Stroud told Marcus to tell his father his old lieutenant said hi. Helena now being the rank of Major in the COG. Marcus said to Dom Santiago's brother, Carlos, that he heard Major Stroud's daughter just joined the military as an officer cadet. Carlos said, Oh, Anya, have you seen her? Wow. Marcus said, Yeah, Carlos, I have, and I noticed. As they were about to arrive at the Acastu Emulsion Fields, Major Stroud told the newly enlisted gears that boot camp was now over. She told them to stay sharp because she didn't want to be writing to anyone's mother. Major Stroud told Bernadette Mataki and Keenan to keep the troops steady as the kids had never been under fire and the lieutenants weren't that experienced either. She said that the Indies haven't visited this place in months, so a visit is overdue. Major Stroud dipped her finger in some emulsion and said, and now you can see what we're fighting for, emulsion. A gear named Quinn said, I thought we were fighting for democracy, because that is what the COG propaganda would have portrayed to the masses. But she said, no, I'm pretty sure that is emulsion, Quinn. Cars don't run on freedom, whatever that is. Meanwhile, at the COG Defense Research Agency in Jacinto, Professor Adam Phoenix's assistant, Neville Estrom, told him that General Bardry just called and said it was something personal. Professor Phoenix called back and he was told that C Company had been deployed to the Akastu refinery. He was told and trusted with this information as he wanted to be kept in the loop about his son, Marcus. Professor Phoenix told his assistant that he wished Marcus would have read physics at Delacroix. He never wanted him to enlist and it was now his first tour of duty. Neville wished he could have enlisted too, but Phoenix reassured him that weapons deployment won wars. Their work mattered, but Neville knew that he'd only failed the army medical again anyway. Professor Phoenix at this point had been working on the Hammer of Dawn for nearly 13 years. If he didn't believe it could stop the war, he could have stayed in the army. It was just the beam alignment that needed work. Phoenix was optimistic that they'd crack it and have a breakthrough eventually. Meanwhile, at Acastu, Carlos asked Marcus what his father said in the letter. Marcus said he was just talking about him coming back and going to uni, like the war was some kind of gap year. Carlos said, he doesn't give up easy, does he? To which Marcus replied, they say I take after him. Another gear asked Marcus what his dad was working on at the DRA, but Marcus said that he never told him any of that stuff. And then, a UIR Chimera appeared. It was doing a recon of the area by the looks of it, as it was moving at maximum altitude. Two days later, the squad were on a night patrol of the area. Carlos wondered how he would react when someone shot at him. They were told by the corporal to get over to the north perimeter gates. One of the drillers thought he heard a bike. He said he'd meet them there. They arrived at the north entrance. They knew there was someone out there. Suddenly, a motorbike sped past, and the corporal began to shoot at it. 50 meters ahead, contact was initiated, and the gears wondered where the rest of their comrades were. Maxon was shot, so Marcus took control by telling Quinn to see to him, and ordered Carlos to give him covering fire as he hurdled over the pipe. Marcus took the fight to the Indy soldiers, but he was immediately told to get down, as backup had arrived in the form of a pack horse. Keenan asked if Marcus was okay and said that they had to get Maxon to a medic, but before anyone could do anything else, a huge explosion took place not too far away. It appeared that the UIR had blown up the wells of the refinery. 
Keenan said, forget that, let's get Maxon. The Gears carried Maxon into the pack horse, but by that point, he had lost a lot of blood. Marcus told him not to tell his father what had happened. Professor Phoenix at this time was at the Phoenix Estate in the East Barricade of Jacinto. A woman called Mrs. Floss fetched him a booklet that was named Engineering Today. As Professor Phoenix read the booklet, he wondered if the UIR had to be working on orbital platforms as well, just like the COG. It was the obvious way to go. Back at the refinery, Marcus told Bernie that Maxon didn't make it. He really felt down, but Bernie reassured him that the Indies could have blown the whole pipeline, but Marcus stopped them. Bernie said, you lose people, it never stops hurting, but we get out of there and do it again, every day, until we finish the job. It was time for them to finish the patrol. Back at the DRA in Jacinto, Professor Phoenix shows Neville the booklet and states that he needs to brief the COG intelligence better so they can understand the significance of the work he and the UIR's professors were racing to produce. And then Professor Phoenix learnt of what happened at the Akastu Emotion Fields. And then Professor Phoenix and Neville ran some more laser alignment tests at the laboratory. But unfortunately, the accuracy of the timing was still off. One week later, back at the refinery, Marcus, Carlos and Quinn are in a pack horse. And Quinn asks Marcus if maybe his dad should work on inventing an alternative to Emotion. But Carlos said, that it was an alternative to the previous fuels, and there were wars over those as well. The Gears began spying to see if they could see or hear the Indie birds. As Quinn climbed up and looked on, he was, unfortunately, sniped in the head, and he died instantly. Marx and Carlos were devastated to see their comrade die, only one week after enlisting. Back at CO's office two days later, Marcus was called to see Major Stroud. She was just writing to Quinn's parents and asked if he was okay. Marcus said, Quinn only lasted one week. Nobody can feel okay about that. Stroud said that they all dealt with it in their own ways. She told him to give his dad a call and that was an order. She told Marcus to never leave things unsaid because you never know if you'll get another chance to say them. Promise Me is a Pendulum Wars comic story set in the 80th year of the war. It begins with Professor Adam Phoenix and his assistant Neville Estrom in a pack horse. Neville says, It's going to work this time, Professor. Adam replies, 17 damn years. It has to. They count down together and then the Hammer of Dawn is deployed from the satellites. They both witness firsthand the devastating destruction from the hammer. It was unlike anything ever seen before. Neville cheers Professor Phoenix on, telling him he did it. The professor replies, but it's taken so damn long to get here. We did it, Neville. Victor Hoffman appears out of one of the pack horses and praises the work, even when those were just two low powered beams. Hoffman noticed that the professor didn't seem too pleased for a man who just gave the coalition a way to end a generational war. Adam Phoenix stated, it'll end this war. I can't speak for the future. Now this is because deep down, he knew of the Locust Horde's existence, but he never told the COG High Command. He opted to help the COG win the war against the UIR by creating the Hammer of Dawn, instead of helping Queen Mira find a cure for lambency. General Bardry asked KR7 how the impact looked from their end, and the Gears replied with optimism, looking forward to seeing the Indies' faces once they introduced to the Hammer. Meanwhile, in Gato City, in the Independent Republic of Ferlin, C Company of the 26th Royal Tyran Infantry are indulged in warfare against the Indies. Marcus Phoenix, Dom Santiago, Hadric Sultan, and Ty Kaliso are in the midst of battle and they plan to get Pad to the roof as he's an expert marksman and can pick off many soldiers. So Ty plans to distract the Indies so he has an RPG at the ready. He gives one of his philosophical quotes We seek balance in war but sometimes we find only stalemate. 
Pad says, Give it a rest, Ty. Just shoot the tossers. Pad begins to run towards the roof side, while Dom and Marcus realise once again, as per usual, they've secured zero ground from the UIR. Pad gets to the rooftop and begins picking off the indies by first taking down the soldier who was manning the turret. Therefore, as the UIR were distracted, Marcus and Cole began to charge in. C Company get to work and take out the rest of the indies. After the battle, Dom wondered, when they raided Asphalt Point, he thought the war would be all over in months, and that was two damn years ago. Sometimes he thought his brother Carlos died for nothing. Marcus told Dom not to think that, they stole the indie research and it saved Professor Phoenix years of work. But of course Adam Phoenix still never told Marcus of the work since it was top secret. Meanwhile at the House of Sovereigns in Jacinto, Professor Adam Phoenix discussed with Chairman Thomas Daliel and Colonel Hoffman how to go about getting the UIR to surrender. Professor Phoenix said that they should ask for their surrender first because regardless they can't evade the hammer anyway. One week later in Jacinto, Hoffman and Bardry are having a coffee and discuss where to choose the target to hit the UIR with the hammer as the Indies declined to pursue peace talks. Bardry said that he's having some trouble with their third fleet in Bonburg at the Austri coast, so why not start there? The Hammer of Dawn was deployed and decimated a UIR battleship into nothing but bits and then the Hammer began targeting the other battleships as the NCOG watched in utter disbelief. A Graznian submarine of the UIR 3rd Fleet picked up a massive explosion and witnessed the COG's nasty new toy. Commander Trescu was alerted. Two days later, in the Pele Republic, at the office of the UIR leader, Yori Dushenko, Chairman Daliel of the COG rang up and asked to put the war to an end once and for all before the COG start targeting the UIR cities. Dushenko said, millions of civilians would die, but Daliel responded, millions already have. Back at the Defence Research Agency in Jacinto, Neville lets Professor Phoenix know that the UIR are going to surrender. The war is nearly over, but Neville wonders why Adam isn't celebrating. But Adam says he's just thinking about what comes next. That was all. But deep down, Adam wrestled with himself on whether he should tell Neville about what really was coming. However, instead of telling Neville, he banked on himself to avoid more bloodshed. He was the only one who could stop it from happening. Five days later, at the UIR held nation of Ferlin, C Company was alerted of the news of terms being discussed for the UIR surrender, all thanks to the deployments of the new COG weapon system known as the Hammer of Dawn, created by Marcus's father, Dr. Adam Phoenix. C Company celebrate, as Ty says, your father found his true path, Marcus. But Marcus responds, yeah, but it's not over yet. This could still take days, weeks. Suddenly, the area was struck by mortar strikes, and so the gears took cover as they realised that the UIR hadn't surrendered just yet. The Gears wondered that the Indies probably thought that it was propaganda and that if the COG were in their situation, they would fight to the last breath as well. The captain tried to offer an informal ceasefire to the UIR Major on the radio, but the Major insisted that Dushenko would never surrender. The captain responded by saying, The game's changed, Major. Call your HQ. Do it. And then, the Indies stopped firing and the Gears are relieved to know that the word was finally getting around. Marcus and Dom really hoped that the 80 years of war were finally over. At the Joint UIR Task Force of the 3rd Fleet, the inmates of the Grazny submarine were informed of the news, but Commander Trescu wasn't buying it. He ordered the submarine to be taken to Brunascu to see what the Grazny High Council had to say. A few hours later, the chairman told Professor Phoenix that he shouldn't be working late, that he should get some sleep. He told him to have a drink and call Marcus. But Adam insisted that there was always another project requiring his time. A project that nobody knew but him. 
at the Visca Military Hospital in Brnascu, in the Republic of Garaznia, Commander Trescu went to see his father, General Igor Trescu, who only had a few hours left to live. His father told him that the cowards of the UIR surrendered and let the cog humiliate them. He wanted his son to promise no ceasefire for Garaznia, that they'll continue to fight on. As everyone carefully watched the time, with only minutes to the ceasefire, Professor Adam Phoenix told Marcus, The war's over now. Promise me you won't do this. Please, stay where you are. I just need more time. Everyone celebrated and looked forward to a new beginning for Sarah. But ultimately, Adam Phoenix knew he was on limited time to create a cure for lambency. Otherwise, the Locust Horde would emerge and change Saren civilization forever. And that, my friends, is the Gears of War comic book lore movie. I really hope you enjoyed, and if you did, then drop a like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you want to support me and the channel further, then you could also become a channel member, and that would be greatly appreciated as well. Thank you for your support as always. I'm your host Stabs, and I'll catch you guys next time.